Hello everybody, I'm Johnny LaRinkler and today I'm holding the unbridled strength of the sun in my hands. I'm also going to be talking about the yellow wallpaper. Let's get started. Okay, so for those of you who do not know, the yellow wallpaper is a book from the late 1800s talking about, um, well, some bad shit. Uh, okay. So, for those of you who do not know what the yellow wallpaper is, I'm going to do a brief summary of the plot. This is also for those of you who are cheating on a test, perhaps? It's not like this is regularly assigned in schools or anything. Brief overview. Let's go. The narrator, her husband, their baby, and their housekeeper. All the characters in the story. The entire story takes place inside this little mini-mansion. Now, this mini-mansion, we don't know much of the layout, but we do know the primary layout of the wallpaper room. Wallpaper's fucking evil in this story. So, that room has window here, window here, doorway here, I believe, and over here, a bed, which is nailed down, and the top of the bed, exactly where the narrator's arms would reach, is all torn. All of the wallpaper just ripped right off. So, uh, she says it's because of kids. But sure. Exactly the arm length of a grown adult woman. Kids have that. It's also worth noting those bars on the windows, though they don't come up. And now that you know what the place looks like, I can actually get into what happens. The narrator has just had her baby. And she is feeling strange, hysterical, and rather queer. <sighs> so, her husband rents out this little mansion for the entirety of the summer, three whole months. The housekeeper and baby come along. Of, of course the baby comes along. The housekeeper tends to the baby more than either of the parents. John, her husband, the one renting this mansion, is not only her husband, but a doctor. This will be important later. Because the narrator is his patient. Spicy. So John tries his very best. He recommends all the things a late 1800s doctor would know. It's not that much, and it's not that helpful, but he's trying, I think. 1800s doctors are kind of something else. If, if you were a patient back then, you sort of had to rely on whoever you walked up to having the exact information right in their well of knowledge and just, you know, pull it out right when they needed it. That's provided your disease was even discovered. So, her odds, already not that good. <sighs> and they only get worse because as the story progresses, John and really everyone else isn't really around. She spends almost three months completely alone, aside from when John comes home from work some nights to sleep, other nights he has to spend the night tending to his patients. Very busy man. Also very logical, we'll get into that later. So the narrator is kind of just trapped in this house, in this, mainly this room alone, and told to rest. And um, it doesn't go well. This is the brief summary, so I'll just say that it her mental state gets progressively, progressively deteriorated. It gets worse. It only goes downhill. Okay, and without spoiling any of the story itself, I'll leave the overview there. If you want to write, like, a quick synopsis for some essay, or if you want to go read the story yourself, this is the part I recommend you pause at. It's not that long a story, only a two-hour read. If, it, if it's interesting to you, I recommend you go read it for yourself. Though I will say, it is one of the best horror stories I've ever read. It's often heralded as a good feminist literature book and a massive critique of the medical establishment at the time. And it is all of those things. It's a very, very progressive book, especially for the time, and it points out a lot of the failings of the old way of thinking about things. Unfortunately for us, this book is still kind of relevant. Not only does it point out the strange treatment of women when it comes to medicine, it also points out just incompetence of a lot of doctors 
If you've ever been to the doctor, maybe a family member has gone to the doctor, you know exactly what you're talking about. You're telling them like, hey, my ankle fucking burns for some reason. And they're like, ah, I have painkillers for that. They hand you something, tell you to skedaddle. And then years later, it comes out that you broke your ankle or that family member has some type of weird cancer. Okay, on to our first main character of this story. John, the husband, the doctor, the objectively in power person in this dynamic of patient wife, doctor, husband. It's really, really a power position. He's the one who drives the story. Even though he's not the main character, he's sort of dictating every encounter that happens, like every conversation he has absolute control over for whatever reason. At one point, she, like, isn't getting well in the beginning. And in the most fucking hilarious move I've ever seen from any doctor ever in any work of media, he threatens to send her to a worse doctor? I love this story so much. It's so insane. Um, this is, like, very early in the story, too. It's lovely. Also, even earlier in the story, when they're first at the mansion picking out rooms, the narrator wants to go to, like, a downstairs room that has, like, a lovely garden view, and John just, like, brushes her aside and is like, no, 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 we must go up to the upstairs room. How else would I be able to sleep with you? The downstairs one is too small for two people. They are here because she is mentally ill and needs a break. According to him. I love his character so much. It's so great. <laughs> Throughout the story, John is prescribing the narrator this uh, rest care. Something the author was actually prescribed and very against. Rest care is the idea that you know, your brain will just fix itself if you chill out for long enough. That is a bad idea. It's just objectively proven to not work. A few weeks into the story, John actually, um, you know, after spending a few days at the house and, like, actually getting accustomed to it, he wants to take the wallpaper down, because this the yellow wallpaper itself, fucking hideous. It's, it's a disgusting little thing, like an odd shade of yellow, sun bleached, and just all of the atrocities that you wouldn't want in a wallpaper. Aside from being yellow, it also has a pattern that is just incomprehensible and pisses off anyone who sees it. So John's going to take down this wallpaper until the narrator voices that she supports this decision and that she has been wanting to take down that wallpaper for some time now. At which point, John has a fucking stroke and and responds with, well, now I can't do it, because you're a woman, like, making decisions, you silly whore. You know only men can do that. For all the women in my audience, there is a reason that John thinks like this. Now, the way men make decisions is very, very efficient. What we do is, it's a lot like those little pet videos that people like to watch of a pet picking out their own name. Well, we put our little decisions on pieces of paper, we snip them up, and we sprinkle them around the table, pull out the old flesh hose, let it squirm around and wrap around one like an anaconda, and boing, bring it right back to us. I don't know how else you would make decisions if you don't have a dick. Honestly. Do you think about them? What's wrong with you? In a more serious note, though, I don't know why John thinks like this, and it's never explained. I would assume that John would be, like, happy that she, too, wants the wallpaper in their bedroom to be gone. But no. He goes on this little tirade that's worse than mine. That's right, that horrible joke I just said, he does something worse. He says... You must control yourself, dear. Hold on. You must control yourself, dear. If I remove the wallpaper, next it'll be... It'll be the curtains. And then, oh, you'll want something insane. Like me to unnail the bed from the floor. Remove the bars from the windows. Because, you know, 
what who who would want the bars to not be on their windows? He also does this thing he likes to do throughout the entire story anytime she brings up like a want where he just says like huh, my dear I would whitewash the cellar if you wanted me to huh, you sweet little thing he does like over promises and then he doesn't do anything just at all it's honestly like almost malicious how dismissive John is throughout this entire story but that brings us on to the narrator and her take on things because the narrator is how do I say this fucking crazy even before she goes insane like every time John is like a dick to her she rationalizes it so hard anyway enough of John we'll get more to him later the next character is the narrator, and I had to touch on John before we touched on our protagonist point of view character, because he just has more stuff going on. Whereas every time John does something, the narrator, like, we see it in her diary, that, like, she's coping super fucking hard. You see, John, he means so well, that's why I'm locked in this room, and why I'm not allowed to go visit the cousins. Oh, that's another big thing that gets brought up. She wants to go and, like, socialize with people. Like, she wants to go visit their cousins. I, I don't know which side, so I'm just saying they're cousins. And John says, I would sooner light a firecracker under your pillow than let you go around such explosive personalities. It would be so unwell for you. That's another, like, dismissive and, like, verbal overcorrection that he does. Well, what's even more infuriating than him doing that is that she's, like, totally okay with it. She's like, yeah, I totally see. I understand where you're coming from. It's worth mentioning she's not locked in the room. She's just, like, super fucking depressed and never leaves. So this happens, like, a few more times where she's, you know, stuck in the room all day and she's tracing the patterns and after a while she starts to see a, a woman behind the patterns, a woman made of shadow, who is creeping and skulking and lurking around. During the day, the woman comes out to play. She creeps around the garden, and she creeps around the path that leads up to the house, and when night comes, she crawls back inside the wallpaper to be trapped once more. This delusion is the first rock of the huge landslide to follow. Because the woman only becomes more prevalent. It gets to a point where, as our narrator spins around to look around the house, she can see the woman out of every window. Not looking at her, but just, like, out there. And this is, like, two months in. It's very clear that rest therapy is not helping. And that the tonics and phosphors and phosphates that she's being prescribed hourly by John aren't helping either. So, around this time, the narrator is taken to doing something that mentally ill people often do, where she pretends to get better in order to, you know, not be mistreated or just, you know, not have people be weird around her. So she's hiding all the symptoms of what appears to be depression. If I want to get more technical, it's probably postpartum depression because it happens right after her baby is born. And she's taken to hiding these symptoms around John specifically. And John will come in at night and be gone during the day. We see a very similar pattern develop, just like a few pages later in the book, <clears throat> where when the Shadow Woman is being described, you'll see that she is contained behind like the membrane of the wallpaper during the night. Whereas during the day, she's allowed to roam free and creep and skulk as she pleases. Interesting detail, no direct correlation is drawn in the story though. Keep that in mind if you're still, you know, doing a paper for a thing. So at this point in the book, so at this point in the book, we're nearing the last quarter. So at this point, so at this point in the book, we're nearing the last quarter. We're... We're pretty much 
insane at this point. Like, she is actively seeing this woman skulk around and talking about how the wallpaper must be full of women because all the patterns look like upside down heads that tried to escape and were cut off. So, um, well, she, in one last ditch effort to, you know, get socialization in her life, she goes to John one more time. One last time in almost a desperate, like, last ditch effort to get some socialization. And she says, you know, I'm all better now, we should go see the cousins. And John just says, no, no, no. Honey, it's... You're not better yet. And... We also see this infuriating rationalization at its absolute peak. Because... We're reading this like a journal entry, and the narrator says, John is right to disallow me from visiting the cousins, for I am not well. I didn't even... And... And I made such a poor case for myself with all my pleading and crying. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. So with that last straw of hope broken, she, on their last day there, vows to herself that she must take down this wallpaper. She fucking has to, okay? It's driven her mad the entire time she's been there. She's hated it. So she, she has to take it down. Or at least, that's what she tells the housekeeper. You see, what she's actually doing is, with the shadow woman, she's tugging on the bars of the wallpaper, and she shakes and she pull, she shakes and I pull and she pulls and I shove, and they do that whole fucking mumbo jumble and unleashes the shadow woman from the wallpaper. And then she tells the housekeeper, Surrounded by this, you know, mess of paper she's done all night. She tells the housekeeper on the morning that they should be leaving to not dis not disturb her. And that she's totally fine. She's just taking down this wallpaper that's horribly hideous. And then our narrator locks the room, putting the key to the room underneath a houseplant uh, down the hall from the room. And she tears off the rest of the wallpaper. And also the rest of her sanity. Because you see, as John returns home that morning, she is not quite herself. John fetches an axe to try and break down the door, but before he gets the axe, our narrator calls out, John, darling, there is no need. The key is under the houseplant. And I said it so softly and so many times until he finally listened. John, the key is under the houseplant. The key is under the houseplant. And when John comes in the room, he finds a tattered mess of wallpaper and his wife crawling around the corners of the room. Because you see, as the wife so eloquently says, They'll never be able to put her back in. She's torn off all the paper. They can't contain her now. The wife believes that she is one of the shadow women. John faints, and our narrator remarks that he has fainted right in her path of creeping, and that now she must creep over him as she creeps her path around the room. And that is the end of the yellow wallpaper. Okay, it's time for some history about this. The reason this book is portrayed the, re the way it is, is because the author of the book, Charlotte Gilman, was prescribed rest therapy by a doctor that didn't fucking listen to her. And it made her feel like she was going insane. It did not work at all for her postpartum depression. And this is almost like a worst case scenario type of book. It, which is why it's such a good horror story. 
because this is a thing that very well could have happened only like a hundred years ago. Okay, now the story's over. I want to get into a really cool theory I read. It's probably not true, but I really like it for the horror aspect. The theory is that the intricate patterns of the wallpaper and the sickly yellow look of it and the stench that follows her could be referring to her own skin. So that, like, when the housekeeper sees her tearing off the wallpaper, she's only tearing the wallpaper. By the time John gets there, she's tearing off her own flesh. And there is not a lot of evidence to show this, but the idea of a skinless person skulking around a room, crawling along the corners, is really fucking terrifying, and I love it so much. I really want it to be true. Unfortunately, I know what this book is actually about. This book is a worst-case scenario for Charlotte Gilman, because she was prescribed, like, rest therapy, the same thing here, which is shown to not help with depression. And Charlotte Gilman also, I believe, had postpartum depression. Again, before it was called postpartum depression. <sighs> so, it's more likely a worst case scenario for mental patients. And it has a lot of strong feminist undertones, but I feel like the point of the story isn't just that, it's also a strong critique at the medical industry and the ignoring of mental health and mental health patients. And the reason I say that is because she shipped a copy of the fucking book to the doctor who recommended her rest therapy for so long and, like, put her on that. She shipped a copy to him. As That's the biggest fuck you I can possibly think of. I absolutely adore that. Oh, um, one final note. For any of you writing essays, do try to, like, pseudo-compare this to modern-day, like, patriarchal stuff, or modern-day medical ignorance and refusal to listen. A lot of doctors are narcissistic assholes. It's almost like a person with a god complex would be inherently drawn to being a doctor for some reason. But I hope you enjoyed this story, and I hope you're having a good evening. Um, if you don't subscribe, I'll tear off my skin and skulk around your room. See ya! Hold on a sec, we aren't done here, I have some more stuff to say. That story was depressing, hopeless, awful. It'd be cruel for me to leave you with nothing but that, so I'm not going to. Here are some ways you can alleviate a yellow wallpaper situation. Step one, divorce. Millions of people do it every year. It must be fun if millions are doing it. Have one, two, three, five divorces. Collect them all. Or, you know, maybe, maybe divorce isn't your style. Maybe it's too messy. Maybe you don't want to lose everything. Maybe you deserve more than half. Well, I have an, I have an option for that too. Here's option two. How to kill your husband. Step one, call up your local pharmacist. Get the most fast acting medication you can get. We're looking for sleep medication. After a little while, and maybe a few appointments, they'll prescribe you some. Make sure to complain about noisy neighbors, noisy kids outside, people driving by at all hours of the night, the hollow thin walls of your apartment. Every now and then someone keeps shooting a gun, and I'm going to shoot them with it if they don't fucking stop. Make sure that you don't sleep before the appointment. Get those big, nasty bags under your eyes and seem a little distraught, but not too distraught that you could actually be suffering from something. Once you get that medication, I want you to take it. Record how fast it works and how strong it is. Odds are you're going to want something stronger, so keep doing this ploy a few times and keep saying that the medication just isn't cutting it. And you need something more powerful. Okay, what you're going to want to do here is... Find a secluded location to have a picnic. First off, no, it doesn't matter how you got here. Now I'm thinking maybe a 
log cabin, a lovely little picnic in the forest. Not a big retreat, not something you would need to call out work for, just something that you would one-off go to, you know, like a lake or um, maybe a nice beach. Something nice and peaceful. I hope you're okay cosplaying as an amateur gardener because you are going to be digging a six to eight foot hole and then putting your emotional burden of a husband into it. Don't worry, you already know what it's like to do all the work because you've slept with him before. This joke has gone way too far. I'm currently digging a grave in my backyard and I just got married last Tuesday. If you're trying to kill your husband, your marriage is probably a little rocky. So in step four, you're going to start a fight with him. Now, it's not so big that he requires any other people to know about it, of course. Just big enough that it requires making up. Emotional abuse is pretty easy. Most people have similar insecurities. Most men are insecure about their cocks. Just tell him his dick looks like a boomerang. He won't want to tell anyone else that you had this argument. Drugs are bad for you. Too many drugs can even kill you or put you in a near comatose state. That would be bad. You don't want your walking life insurance policy to die now, do you? I mean, your husband to die. What, what, what are we talking about again? Ooh, spinny circle. Before fully committing to going to the picnic, you're going to need to leave your phones at home. That's right, you're disconnecting for the weekend. Also, does your car have a GPS? You should check. If it's a newer model, it just might. If it has one of those little touchscreen thingies, it just might as well. Did you know that screwdrivers are free if you run fast enough? You can unscrew that bitch, you can pop it right open, and just tear all of the cables out. No one can stop you! By the way, this video was made for comedic purposes. All of this advice is fake in Minecraft, and should not be taken seriously. Did you know that tarps are both waterproof and very cheap? Did you know that the human jugular is irreparable? And did you know that Coca-Cola can dissolve almost anything? These are three very interesting facts, and what you do with this information is entirely upon you. Police officers hate it when you remove the teeth and fingerprints from your victims, the same way I hate it when you have a bad day. Now I hope you all had a lovely time.